Our second scripture reading is found in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter number 5, and beginning with verse number 1. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called, the, in Hebrew, Bethesda, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, take your mat, and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now, that day was a Sabbath. May God bless the reading of the word, the hearing of the word, and may we all hear in it a word that is to us and is for us on this very day. We began our immersion into the living the questions experience last Sunday, and let me just stop before I say anything else and encourage you to stay. Uh, I, uh, just sitting in the back, was able to sit behind our congregation and learn some things that I didn't know about folks and uh, how they got to where they are today. So it was a great experience. I would encourage you to participate with us. Last week, as we began, one of the participants, one of the, the ministers involved in, in the video portion, prefaced his remarks by implying that he was going to sum up the essence of the Bible in a few sentences. Well, it, and he, he was going, his was going to be an effort to debunk the notion that the Bible is a perfect document which contains one right answer for every question. Now, my antenna went up because I appreciate efforts to summarize complex matters in only a few words. Admittedly, most of us as preachers are better at taking simple matters and complicating them with a lot of words. So this sounded like a noble effort to be in, uh, and so I was, I was listening very attentively. This is what he said about the Bible, and this is a very loose paraphrase and is based solely on my memory which is questionable at times. The Bible, he said, was an effort by its, its authors to articulate the fact that the world is in trouble. The, the planet was in peril. And even thousands of years ago, those who were paying attention could take note of this. But despite the fact that the world was in trouble, or even better put, because the world was in trouble, People needed faith stories, which allowed them to reflect on how God continued to interact with the world in its trouble, and how we might interact with one another and in partnership with God to help this world and to be ministers to this world in its trouble. And finally, he said it was an attempt it was written, he said, because people needed stories of redemption and hope to face the challenges which accompany a journey on this planet, in this world which is in trouble. Now, as far as, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, as far as short explanations of complex matters go, I thought that was a pretty good one. At least for today, I want to use that same interpretive umbrella as a way of understanding this particular passage from the Gospel of John. How might we read this narrative if we understand it as a faith story written to a world in trouble? What might this story have to tell us about how we can interact with God and with one another in the midst of living in this troublesome world? And how might this particular story serve as a story of redemption and hope? The power and poignancy of this passage, of this story, for me is found in the fifth verse, which on the surface looks like it's just a little bit of helpful information. Here we are informed that the man had been in this condition for 38 years. 
We don't have to do too much digging to discover that 38 years was longer than the average life expectancy of a male living in the Roman Empire. So we might put it this way. He had been sick for a lifetime. All that he had known, at least all that he could remember, was of being sick. All that he could remember was of being like the world, of being in this troubled state. So we might begin, if we are to find a word in this passage, which is to us and for us on this day, we must begin with the admission that our world is in trouble. We received one of those stark reminders of this truth just last weekend when an 18-year-old went on a murderous rampage in Buffalo, New York. He will have his name added to that list of murderers who have left behind in the family and friends of their victim scars that will never heal in this lifetime. And I know that it seems like righteous indignation is about the only, uh, it's about the only emotion warranted in these circumstances, but it's also the easiest. And I wonder if we need to dig a little deeper. We could just label him as evil and be done with it right there. But there are some deeper questions which we must ask about this world and about the trouble that we are in and about how we might be God's people in the midst of this troubled world. How can a young person become so lost and so filled with hatred in but 18 years. How can, how can someone who, before they're even old enough to buy beer, can become so deluded by racist and white supremacist ideologies that they could muster both the plan and the capacity to act these crimes out? We might comfort ourselves by declaring ourselves different, and we are. We aren't him, and he isn't one of us, but he did grow up in the same troubled world in which we live. As the news of his short but troubled life continues to emerge, it seems clearly evident that he all but announced to the entire world his intentions and what existed in his heart and in his mind and his intent to carry out acts of violence against people of color. And yet he was still given the space and was able to put his hands on the weapons which allowed him to carry out his plan with the deadliest of efficiency. Our world is troubled. So now let's look at this, to this story. And this time, see, let us see ourselves and let's see our troubled world around that pool. Now, on this point, I want to be clear. This man is not the victim of something. Cannot be clearer about that. This man is not the victim of something, but he is the product of something. He wouldn't have, would not have had to look hard, and he would not have had to listen terribly closely to find messages which would fuel his hatred. hatred which in his deluded mind would justify his hatred. And he would not have to turn over too many stones to find messages which would allow him to dehumanize the objects of his hatred. He would hear these messages coming from people who hold power, people who hold political power and exercise political influence. He would hear these messages from people who hold religious power, and who impose religious influence. He would hear these messages coming from people whose power has been sanctioned and whose podiums have been protected. So if we want to call him a racist, that label is more than warranted. If we want to call him a murderer, he clearly fits the bill. If we want to, based upon those atrocities he committed, to label him as evil, we can certainly make that case. If we want to call his crimes hate crimes, I don't think we need the help of any law enforcement agencies or any courts to justify that designation. 
But I would suggest that while accurate, those are the easiest responses. The more challenging responses require that we see that we share this troubled world with people like this man. And if the world ever needed the church to rise up to its highest self, in the midst of the trouble, it is now. I believe this very passage before us today is calling the church to its highest self. It is important that as we follow this story forward, uh, but beyond the section we read, that we, that we hear where it goes. So, so bear with me. Let me read just a little ways forward. So the Jews, following this event, following this healing, said to the man who had been cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, the man who made me well said to me, take up your mat and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said this to you to take it up and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore, the Jews started persecuting Jesus because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. Just a quick but important note to help us to avoid stumbling into a, an anti-Semitic take on this passage. When John refers to the Jews, he's not talking about the, the Jewish people as a whole. He is talking about a particular strand of Jewish leadership who are stuck in ways of being which won't allow them to see what God is doing in and through Jesus in this troubled world. Moreover, these leaders are not the enemies of Jesus, and we shouldn't paint them that way. Jesus' mission and ministry was for the very purpose of awakening them. Now, here's the question that we should be asking about this text. Jesus knew and understood the Sabbath restrictions and laws as well or better than anyone. Understanding that, why did he heal this man on the Sabbath? He had been sick for 38 years. Jesus could have waited until the next day. Jesus could have waited until sundown on that very day for this healing. And he would have been applauded by everyone. But instead, our sweet little Jesus, and I say that with tongue firmly in, in cheek, our sweet little Jesus intentionally created this conflict that could have easily been avoided. I should have titled this sermon, Jesus Ain't So Sweet. <laughs> we can't be certain why Jesus, with purpose and intention, created this fire, lit this fire. But I will give you my interpretive two cents. I want us to think about the religious institution to whom Jesus is speaking as the church. Let's bring it home. Let's think of it as the church. Jesus is intent not only to heal the troubled man, but to heal and awaken a troubled church, which is needed desperately in this troubled world. Jesus could have waited a day to heal the man, but he wants more. He wants to call the church away from the traditions and conventions which get in the way and don't allow the church to be an institution of healing and an instrument of healing in this world. And starting a little fire there, didn't seem too much for that purpose. Jesus wants, I believe, for the church to be more like the pool and less like the temple. Homer Henderson is a UCC pastor from California who pointed out in his commentary uh, on this passage something I'd never thought of. The pool of Bethesda existed in the very shadow of the temple. In the very shadow of the temple, the place of institutionalized religion. Let's do his commentary. It's important, I think. Interesting, isn't it, that the pool in this story from the Gospel of John is right in the shadow of the temple, right in the shadow of the church. How many people do you know? I mean, really hurting people who left the temple, left the church for the pool. In John's story, the temple or institutionalized religion, the church, wanted nothing to do with the undeserving troubled people at the pool. So they went to the pool, and so did Jesus. And that's where Jesus healed, down by the poolside. 
One more quote, and this one from Anne Lamott in her book, Tra Traveling Mercy. She said, after a difficult year in her own life, broken things have been on my mind because so much has broken down in my life this year and in the lives of the people I love. Lives broke, hearts broke, health broke, minds broke. Her preacher, she said, her preacher's name was Veronica, said that this is life's nature, that lives and hearts get broken. Those are people we love. Those are people we will never meet. She said that the world sometimes feels like the waiting room in an emergency room, and that we, who are more or less okay for now, need to take care, take the tenderest possible care, take the tenderest possible care of the more wounded people in the waiting room until a healer arrives. Jesus had no longing to be the enemy of the temple, any more so that it, he would have a longing to be the enemy of the church. But what he is doing in this story is calling us as religious institutions to rise up in these troubled days and in this troubled world so that as we are able, we take the tenderest possible care of the most wounded people until the healer comes into our midst. I want to share a story, and I think it was that quote. In fact, I'm sure it was from Anne Lamott, which prompted it back into my memory. When I was 16, a junior in high school, I injured my neck at wrestling practice. It wasn't life-threatening, but it required a visit to the emergency room and, and frankly, has affected the range of motion in my neck until this day. At least that's the excuse I use when the golf shot goes awry. After returning from the ER, I attempted to sleep, but was in too much pain to go to sleep. And my, mo my mother knocked on my door and asked if she could come in and pray for me. Now, I should tell you, at 16, I didn't do much praying of my own. Didn't have a whole lot of trust in its efficacy or power. But I was, I was desperate and also knew that she was only asking to be polite and that she was going to come in my room and pray for me whether I gave her permission or not. So in the tenderest possible way, in the tenderest possible way, in a, in a manner that I can feel to this day, she placed her hand on my neck and prayed. It was the first time I had ever heard anyone pray for someone in that manner. She prayed as one who didn't wonder if it was going to help. She prayed as someone who knew it was going to help. She didn't pray as one who was trying to get her prayers up into heaven. She prayed like somebody who believed that God was right there in my bedroom. Before long, I drifted off to sleep, and I awoke the next morning to a sore neck, but one now free from the excru excruciating muscle spasms of the night before. And I was on the road to healing. Now, here's the question. Did God respond to my mother's prayers and cause the natural process of healing to be expedited? I don't know. In fact, I have no idea. I truly don't. And if that were the case, I would be at a loss to know why my mother's prayers were heard while the mothers of children in much graver danger than I were not. I would no more know how to answer that than I would know why Jesus picked this one man for healing out of the hundreds who had gathered around that pool. So I'll only tell you what I know. When someone loves you enough that your pain is their pain, and when that sort of compassion, that sort of gut-level compassion is expressed, it is a powerful and it is a healing thing. I know that when... I know that when people of faith interact with God and with one another and with the tenderest possible care attempt to alleviate even a small portion of the world's pain and trouble, it is a powerful and healing thing. It is to just such heights that we, the church, are called. And if ever, if ever the troubled world needed the church to hear that calling and to walk in that calling. 
it is now. If ever the troubled world needed the church to speak with courage and with clarity for, towards ends of justice, it is now. If ever the troubled world needed the church to rise above any heights that it has risen to before, that we might be Christ's hands and feet and eyes and voice in this troubled world, it is now. God has called us to great heights because God believes that with one another and with God's power and spirit moving among us that we can reach great heights. Amen.